boldness is a benefit, yeah, right. but you could also say that boldness is a cost. Because if they're too bold, then we are afraid of them and we remove them. Right. And before releasing these coyotes back into the urban wilds, the team plucks a couple whiskers. Each whisker holds chemical evidence of what the coyote has been eating and whether it's relying on human food. In fact, we just finished a diet analysis of our most urban coyotes, our uber urban coyotes downtown. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that was the big question is, yeah. can those downtown animals live on anything other than human food? Right. And so what we found was they did have a higher level of human food in their diet. Mm -hmm. But that was even at the highest levels was still only about half of their diet. Half of their diet was natural, rabbits being a big one. All of this information is giving Stan a fuller picture of how coyotes are succeeding in the city. So it turns out their survival is much higher in the city than it is out in the country. Why is that? Why is that is because the number one predator on coyotes mm -hmm. in the Midwest is people. But it's hunting and trapping. And so when you move into the city, you don't have hunting and trapping. So you, you essentially remove us as a predator. So they simply have to manage themselves and avoid our cars. That's the biggest threat to them. Sure. How do they deal with that? Right, so they have a variety of different adjustments that they've made. Uh, one is they become nocturnal as they live in a more heavily developed area. In the wild, coyotes can be active throughout the day. Becoming exclusively nocturnal helps them avoid us, which is one benefit, mm -hmm. but also helps them cross roads because in the middle of the night, traffic volume is much less. Sure. The other thing that they do as far as road crossing is that they watch us and they watch our traffic mm -hmm. a lot. <laughs> really? They sit on the side of the road and they take mental notes. They can learn that there are certain streets where there's street lights. So they know that the traffic will stop. So all they have to do is wait. And if they just wait <laughs> and- Do you see, have you seen coyotes waiting for traffic lights? All the time. Really? So survival is very high, especially for the pups. The pup class is the one that benefits the most. Even with all these roads and these cars, they learn so well from their parents that they actually have the same chance of survival as their parents do. And it turns out that the Chicago area, because of the population growth, we're actually producing excess numbers of individuals. And so there are many coyotes that are leaving Chicago and are actually filtering back out into the right. rural areas or moving on into other cities, such as Milwaukee. Stan hopes that all of this research he's gathering will ultimately help us make informed decisions about how to manage our new neighbors, or whether to manage them at all. They really don't need our help. <laughs> but they're doing they're pretty really, good on their own. They're doing pretty well on their own. This is one big, natural, unplanned experiment. It's an experiment that was initiated by coyotes. Mm -hmm. No human introduced <laughs> them to the city. They just came here, yeah. Right, they just came here. So we don't know what the final outcome of this large experiment actually is going to be. So will they just continue to coexist with us largely or will we see an increase in conflicts? And if so, what would be the best ways to minimize those conflicts? Urban nature is made possible in part by the following. Well, hello and welcome to our first Friday series of watch parties about all things Belle Isle and the Detroit River, especially as they relate to the Great Lakes region. I am Anna Marie Seisling, associate producer of Great Lakes Now, an initiative of Detroit Public Television. And that awesome video that we just watched is called Coyote Comeback. That came to us courtesy of WTTW's Urban Nature. It's a really cool digital series that explores the surprising slices of nature thriving in America. America's largest cities. You can watch the entire series at wttw.com slash urban nature. We'll drop that link into the chat for folks who want to check it out after the watch party. I highly recommend it.
So we have a really great lineup of guests for today's watch party. But first, I'd like to welcome our co-hosts for this series of watch parties. Of course, the Belle Isle Conservancy, WDET, Detroit's NPR station, and our newest partner, independent environmental newsletter, Planet Detroit. And a very special welcome to our co-hosts for this month's watch party, WTTW, Chicago's PBS, of course, WPBS-TV, Watertown, New York, WQLN in Erie, Pennsylvania, WNMU-TV, PBS in Marquette, Michigan. Michigan, PBS Western Reserve in Kent, Ohio, and Milwaukee PBS. All right, so at this point, it should come as no surprise that for this month's watch party, we are talking all about coyotes and how they're living among us in American cities all throughout the Great Lakes region. And to everyone watching on Facebook and YouTube Live, feel free to chat with us as we go. Of course, your role is crucial in these watch parties. So drop a note in the chat if you have a really cool coyote story or a sighting or maybe even a picture that you took when you did see a coyote out somewhere. Drop all that into the chat. We'll be sure sure to work it in and feature your comments and questions as we go. All right, so now I'm really excited to welcome our guest for today's watch party. So first up, we have Dan Protess. Dan is the executive producer of WTTW Chicago's Urban Nature Series. Dan, welcome. Hey there, thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Excited to have you here. Next up is Dr. Naima Harris. Dr. Harris is director of the Applied Wildlife Ecology Lab and associate professor in the Yale School of the Environment. Dr. Harris, great to have you with us today. Thanks so much. Looking forward to the conversation. Absolutely. And then Amy Green, who is Nature Center Director at the Belle Isle Nature Center. Some of you who've been watching these videos for a while will recognize Amy. She's been on with us before. Welcome back, Amy. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Absolutely. All right. So let's get started with Dan. So Dan, I'm curious if you can kind of start out by talking a little bit about what the experience was like producing that piece we just watched, working with noted wildlife biologist Stan Garrett for that particular story. Yeah. So this was this urban nature series was kind of a dream project. We basically flew all over the country looking uh, at how nature was thriving in really surprising, unusual places everywhere from New York's Bronx River to uh, we were at a marine mammal hospital just outside San Francisco. It, this story, of course, was just right in my backyard here in Chicago. Uh, Stan, as actually often happened uh, in the making of this series, Stan called me and said, OK, you're going to meet me at a Home Depot parking lot, which <laughs> something about this Something about this series, usually, you know, I, I make documentaries for a living. You meet someone at their office. It was always like a gas station parking lot or a Home Depot uh, because obviously nature is unpredictable and you have to go where nature is. Uh, and so we used that tracking device. And what was so amazing, and you saw it there in the story, is he has this uh, coyote uh, radio collared and you'd think it would still be really easy to track it down. It was not. And literally, we found ourselves at the base of this railroad embankment and um, probably uh, between you and me and your viewers, we're trespassing on uh, railroad property, running along the tracks, trying to track down a coyote and uh, eventually was able uh, to pinpoint it. But I think it really does speak to the fact that these are, they're, they're living amongst us, but they're really elusive creatures. And especially here, so my understanding based on our, our conversation a few days ago is in Detroit, it's not unusual to, to see coyotes. Here in Chicago, I've lived here my entire life. I have seen one coyote my entire life up until uh, the day that I went out looking for stands. So they're actually hard to find. And what you probably saw on that map that we showed in the piece was because they're radio collared, you can see exactly their movements throughout the city. And um, that particular uh, coyote that we were tracking, I looked at the map and I saw, oh, wow, that's I see exactly where it's going. There's a park here. It's hanging out in Columbus Park. Oh, and there's railroad tracks down there. Oh, and then there's another set of railroad tracks right here. So they're really, uh, as he said, traveling along these uh, human uh, corridors for transportation, make good uh, corridors for coyote transportation. Um, and as a matter of fact, that was kind of a theme throughout our entire urban nature series was that when, when you know, nature kind of has a way of finding a way in the city, Mm -hmm. And it's often um, creating these kind of wildlife corridors. We saw it in New York, as a matter of fact, um, where uh, birds are using green roofs to travel across the city uh, wow. along these corridors. 
Very cool. So that kind of elusive nature of coyotes definitely sounds like it was probably one of the more challenging elements of telling this story. But I'm wondering, as you were saying, you know, of course, Detroit, and we'll get into this a little bit later in the watch party, is different just in terms of the kind of amount of vacant space that there is uh, kind of in pockets all throughout the city. You only seeing one coyote in your whole life living in Chicago. Tell me what was the coolest or maybe the most surprising moment for you when you were filming and researching and working on this coyote company? backstory? I guess so. I, I live not too far from Lincoln Park, which is along Chicago's lakefront. And uh, in, in fact, I'm always going around this uh, pond called South Pond. And South Pond is about as nature as, sorry, as urban as, uh, a, a, as a city can possibly get. You're literally, it's this one little pond, man-made pond, but you're surrounded by skyscrapers. Uh, and what I found as we were filming the story and talking with the experts is they've actually placed uh, cameras that are automatically triggered by wildlife uh, in the proximity to South Pond. And a lot of coyotes have been showing up there. And the fact that and so now as I'm uh, usually jogging past South Pond, I find myself uh, on the lookout and still haven't seen one. But the fact that coyotes managed to thrive and somehow hide in such a dense urban area is really uh, amazing, is amazing. Absolutely. And, you know, as we said, so this video came out a few years back, I think in 2017. So um, any sense of what's happening now with the coyote population around Chicago in 2021? I know there were a, kind of a lot of narratives swirling around in the beginning of the pandemic about kind of this idea of nature um, reclaiming and kind of presenting itself in um, some in some places where it necessarily, you know, we weren't necessarily seeing it as much. Um, ha have you been seeing more coyotes? Are there more kind of coyote narratives floating around these days in Chicago? There, there are not. And as a matter of fact, I checked back in with Dr. Stan Garrett, and uh, it sounds like there's no evidence to suggest that coyotes have been any more or less present uh, during the pandemic uh, than before or after. That they, they're adaptable creatures, and they adapt to changes in the world and the environment. Um, and so there's all kinds of, I, I think as a scientist, they're pretty careful uh, about what factors might be influencing any changes in behavior. But the changes in behavior they have witnessed definitely cannot be attributed to the pandemic. Got it. Dan Protest, executive producer of WTTW's Urban Nature Series. Stick around uh, just in case we have any questions kind of trickle in, people who are curious about how you went about telling this story. Thank you so much. And as a reminder to everybody watching on YouTube and Facebook Live, if you have coyote stories, coyote sightings, we want to hear them. So drop those comments and questions into the chat. I'll be sure to work those in as we go. All right. So now I'd like to talk with Dr. Naima Harris. Uh, Dr. Harris, I'm wondering if you can start uh, just kind of by briefly giving us an idea of your research about coyotes in the Great Lakes region overall. Yeah, so a lot of the work that we have been doing has used the invasive or non-invasive approaches. So in our video, you saw that um, Dr. Garrett used radio telemetry and collars, and that's one way to study carnivores or, or coyotes in the city. And there's other ways as well. And so some of the ways that we're using um, include putting remote cameras out um, on a tree that is remotely triggered. So as an animal walks by or as a coyote particularly walks by, we get a picture of it. Okay. And so that gives us information about its presence, what habitat it's using. We also spend a whole lot of time collecting and searching for poop or scat, or feces, whatever your favorite word is. Um, and that gives us information about the diet. It also gives us information about health. And so those techniques overall, whether it's radial telemetry and collaring, whether it's remote cameras, whether it's scat surveys, those studies are happening across the Great Lakes um, in order for us to get a really comprehensive view of how the coyote populations are doing and how they are making a comeback. Got it. I also want to be sure to uh, drop a link in the chat to the uh, Yale School of Environment where you are an associate professor so that folks who want to find out more about all of the great work happening at the Yale School of Environment, they can do so by clicking on that link after the watch party. So as far as any kind of notable shifts in coyote behavior and habitat use, what are you gleaning and kind of learning from the research as it stands right now? 
Yeah. So regardless of which city you focus on, whether it's Chicago or Minneapolis or Detroit, um, all of those cities are different in terms of their human population, their buildings, their road infrastructure. Are they close to a river or a water body? But what's not different is that coyotes are adaptable. So we are seeing a variety of different behaviors, um, a variety of different choices that coyotes are making in these urban spaces. Mm -hmm. And so in Detroit, we may see shifts in their activity pattern. Um, and so over time, people are increasingly seeing them more during the day. So shifting from a nocturnal behavior like we saw in, in Chicago in the video um, versus in Detroit when you're you're seeing them in the middle of the day. Mm -hmm. There's also variation in, in the diet. So mm -hmm. they're eating squirrels and mice and cottontail rabbits, uh, but they will absolutely eat a donut or a peanut butter and jelly sandwich as well. All right. Um, and, you know, going back to what Dan was saying a moment ago about Chicago and how Chicago is obviously a little bit different than Detroit, just in terms of what the kind of overall um, land use picture of the city is. I'm wondering, you know, when you and I talked a couple days ago, you mentioned Detroit's different. Detroit's a little bit of an anomaly. So talk a little bit about what sets Detroit apart from other Great Lakes cities when it comes to carnivore and specifically coyote habitat. Yeah, Detroit is special. Um, and one of the reasons why it is special is because unlike other cities where you have this built environment, you have the presence of roads or rail railways and buildings and community centers and schools. OK, Detroit has that built infrastructure, um, but the density, the human population density, unlike other cities that have grown over the last several decades, um, we don't see that pattern in Detroit. Instead, in Detroit, the population density has gone down um, to about 700,000 individuals now. And so there is a distinction in that you have all of the buildings, all of the roads that are still there, but the human pressure has actually changed. Um, there's an increased abundance of vacant lots, which means there's additional habitat that wildlife and carnivores in particular are able to exploit because of those changes. OK. And, you know, we've also been hearing just kind of in the local media in the last you know, few years, more and more stories are coming up with people who are concerned about, I don't want coyotes in my yard. I have a little dog. And I know that you've actually done a little bit of research looking at the kind of cross species relationship between domesticated dogs and coyotes. Can you talk a little about that briefly? Yeah, so it's really interesting because we, we have to remind ourselves that coyotes are predators, they are carnivores, and in cities they are often the apex or literally the top dog in the system. But they are coexisting, they are co-occurring, they are sharing space and sharing resources with foxes that are similar to coyotes, but also the myriad of, of dogs that we have. So whether it's a chihuahua or a pit bull or a German shepherd, um, all of those dogs are also interacting with green spaces. And so some of the work that we've done was looking at both the prey community, so looking at cop cottontail rabbits, for example, and wanting to know, well, does the presence of a dog versus the presence of humans versus the presence of coyotes, does do they have different impacts on the prey community? So are dogs asserting itself? Are they competing with the coyotes? We also looked at whether or not humans influence and how much the coyote interacts with some of the other carnivore species that are there. And so that's been really interesting to think about this landscape in a community framework, mm -hmm. recognizing that coyotes are situated in an environment, of course, with lots of people, but lots of other animals as well, both wild and domestic. Mm -hmm. And we just got a, a comment in from Nancy Moore. So here's what Nancy says. I saw a coyote following up the driveway of houses in our residential neighborhood in Madison, Wisconsin at 4.30 p.m. on a Sunday afternoon. This coyote went up to the house, then turned around and went out to the street to the next driveway. They were around a lot there. I have heard a lot about the hybrid of coyote and wolf in our current neighborhood in Brookfield, Wisconsin, a more wooded neighborhood. We often hear coyotes and wolves howling at night uh, or when they hear an emergency vehicle. Um, what, what do you know about, about that kind of hybrid species, Dr. Harris? 
Yeah, so that's actually becoming, um, that's a really interesting and kind of hot topic um, in lots of areas across the Great Lakes. Um, the hybridization of gray wolves and coyotes. So when they were kind of co-occurring and coexisting um, in certain geographies, there was opportunities for, for that breeding. And then those individuals then dispersed to other areas in order to escape competition from the gray wolves, et cetera. There's also cases of domestic dog and coyotes also also um, being um, mating and hybridizing as well. And so the reality is that as we're thinking about these interactions, there's lots of different opportunities for kind of competition, hybridization, and even conflict to emerge because of it. Okay. And um, I'd love to see these comments coming in too. So we have a really cool resource that just came in from Kelly Borgman, uh, a great resource for people concerned about coyotes and dogs. Kelly dropped the link in there. So if folks want to learn more about that, you can check out Kelly's comment. Um, and then lastly, Dr. Harris, uh, I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about this youth program that you have in place called Wildlife Neighbors. This is for Detroit sixth and eighth graders. Tell me a little bit about it. Yeah, we're really excited about. So one of the advantages of, of working in an urban space as a wildlife ecologist is that our work, uh, we can partner with lots of different communities, lots of different organizations, lots of different schools to partner and engage um, other individuals in the work that we're doing. So we're really excited about this program called Wildlife Neighbors, where we're bringing sixth to eighth grade students um, along with their teachers and even sometimes their parents. Um, we want to facilitate an opportunity to investigate the wildlife neighbors, to investigate the wildlife that we have in their backyard. And so we're working with these students to identify their own research questions. They're looking at the images from the camera and they're asking their own research questions. Why are we seeing this coyote in this location and not this other location? Why are there so many deer in this park and not another park? Why do we see them active at this time of day versus another day? So we're literally creating um, many scientists, um, many environmentalists um, mm -hmm. in the context of this work. And it's really exciting to see the energy and the enthusiasm um, and really think about doing science together in, in a place like Detroit. Very cool. And we'll be sure to drop a link into the chat for folks who want to learn more about the Wildlife Neighbors Program. All right, Dr. Harris, Director of the Applied Wildlife Ecology Lab and Associate Professor in the Yale School of the Environment. Thank you so much for joining us. Stick around in case we have other uh, questions come in that you are you know, uniquely qualified to answer. Mm -hmm. And I want to round things out now with Amy Green over at the Belle Isle Nature Center. Uh, and of course, we'll drop a link in also to the Belle Isle Nature Center for for people who want to learn more about some of the cool stuff going on over at that facility. All right. So Amy, in your role at the Nature Center, I'm wondering, I mean, I've definitely seen coyotes at Belle Isle. I hear a lot of people, talk, you know, talk about seeing them at the island, seeing them in Detroit neighborhoods. You talk a lot with Detroiters, people who come not just from Detroit, but from all over the metro Detroit area visiting the park. What are the questions that you're hearing most often from people when it comes to coyotes? And what do you think makes them kind of such a hot topic? for people? Well, I think they're cool. And I think a lot of the people who are checking in with us about it also think they're cool, compelling, or interesting. And um, a lot of those questions were answered all throughout this segment today. So I hope a lot of the folks who have been checking in with us have been, been able to watch this um, because it's been so informative. And I think the number one um, question we typically get from folks who are curious about coyotes is in relation to their own safety, because it's something that perhaps they hadn't been familiar with growing up in the neighborhood um, and that they're seeing more of now, they want to know, am I safe? Is my pet safe? Um, and typically our response is likely so. Um, they're shy, more shy than you are most likely. These coyotes want to be left alone. And uh, our main piece of advice is always let the wildlife be wild. Mm -hmm. um, sure. So, go, please go ahead. Oh, yeah. And we, we just try to remind people to never, ever try to feed or tame any wildlife at all. Um, and when it comes to food, also, when you see coyote in your neighborhood and you maybe are concerned about them being in your personal space, one, one um, helpful thing to do is to be mindful of the food that you have out. Mm -hmm. While your bird seed or something may not be attracting the coyote, those rodents who are coming to eat it may be a food source. Um, and so that's another thing is that they're often misunderstood 
is something to fear when um, in spaces, um, some of the things that they are eating as part of their diet, which you've heard, are what a lot of um, people who live in a city might consider nuisance animals. So mm -hmm. that, that food web keeps going. Yeah. And our own Zach Allen says coyotes would always roam the disc golf course in Mount Pleasant during the day. As you said, Amy, looking for food. We always just kind of let them walk on through while we played. We have another coyote story coming in from John Myers on the Great Lakes Now Facebook, who says, I've seen a coyote six times over the past decade in the Jefferson Chalmers Riverfront Parks and was able to video one last spring in Lakewood East Park, less than 20 feet from me. There have been many pictures and videos shared on next door Jefferson Chalmers recently. So for folks living in the JC community, you can hop on over to the next door and check that out. Um, and so we, and we have a question coming in now from Barbara Sepierski, uh, who lives in suburban Detroit next to a golf course in Heinz Park slash Rouge River. We had a large number of coyotes about four years ago. They appeared quite comfortable walking through the neighborhood. We noticed a lot of dead possums. We also noticed that a rat problem and feral kittens disappeared entirely. Really interesting to hear the way coyotes are kind of shaping that uh, that neighborhood ecosystem. She says, we had one coyote with a bad case of mange that eventually we found dead in a neighbor's yard. What do we do if we find coyotes with mange? Are they suffering? Amy, I'll give you a crack at that, but uh, Dr. Harris is you know, probably also qualified to answer this as well. Yeah, the, the advice we tend to give people is to contact your local animal control, the DNR. Um, if it looks, if it's alive and suffering, there are licensed rehab facilitators um, the nature center is not the place where you would want to, you know, take, take any kind of injured animal. We would advise you to call the experts on that for sure. Got it. And then another coyote story. Love to see these coming in. This one comes from Mary Bogish. Uh, I was thrilled and fascinated to see a coyote in my yard in Royal Oak, Michigan. It was so it was so scared of me and ran away looking back with fear in its eyes. I wanted the moment to last to see its majestic wildness, but it hasn't returned. Mary, I am right there with you every time I've seen a coyote. It just kind of captivates me in this way that I can't quite describe. Definitely uh, has a different effect on me than seeing, you know, just the, the neighborhood cat or squirrel or something. These are really special animals. So, you know, I... That being said, of course, taking safety and, you know, respect for coyotes into consideration, Amy, I'm wondering if you have any tips for like best times of day or maybe places to try to go to spot coyotes. And then adversely for people who are like, keep the coyotes away, um, if there are also best practices to kind of, you know, keep coyotes, uh, kind of coyote deterrence from your yard, if you will. Right. Well, as you as you have um, heard and seen throughout this segment, they are elusive and they are shy. They tend to um, be more seen in the late winter because that is their breeding season. From what I understand, I'm not an expert and I'd be I stand corrected if I'm wrong on that. And um, early morning and late evening. As far as locations, that's a tricky one um, because they you know, they they do travel a bit, although they they'll tend to stay in a particular area, they do travel throughout that area looking for food and shelter, and they are good at hiding. And I would, I would be mindful at any time to advise anybody where to go and find one. Mm -hmm. However, um, like Dr. Harris and many others, putting out trail cameras is a very non-invasive way for you to capture all of the wildlife in your neighborhood um, and see who's been there and what they're up to without interfering with them. And we like, have some of those photos too, not to cut you off, but just so if we can show some of those photos as you continue to kind of talk a little bit about this. Oh, absolutely. Cool. Um, also, if you are in a situation in which a coyote, um, you're feeling fearful or confronted, it's um, not too hard to do what, what they call the go away coyote to make yourself very big and very loud. And instead of turning your back and running, to, um, to move forward and be very noisy. And so go away coyote is a way that um, we've understood as a, as a quick way to help people remember that you're bigger and louder. And they, that healthy fear of humans is um, sometimes a necessary uh, for all parties involved. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. Well, Amy Green, Nature Center Director at the Belle Isle Nature Center, thank you so much again for joining us. And let's bring all of our guests back thank in. Um, I'd love to thank all of them. Dan Protest, Executive Producer of WTTW Chicago's Urban Nature Series, Dr. Naima Harris, Director of the Applied Wildlife Ecology Lab and Associate Professor in the Yale School of the Environment. And of course, Amy Green, Nature Center Director at the Belle Isle Nature Center. Thank you all so much for joining today. This is great. Thank you so much. Thanks, that was fun.
Thanks. And a big thank you to everyone over at WDET, Detroit's NPR station, including Maida Stangy and Lisa Durden, of course, the Belle Isle Conservancy and Mary Ogilvie, Planet Detroit, and our other co-hosts for today, WTTW Chicago's PBS, WPBS-TV Watertown, New York, WQLN Erie, Pennsylvania, WNMU-TV PBS in Marquette, Michigan, Milwaukee PBS, and PBS Western Reserve in Kent, Ohio. Also, thank you to the whole team at Detroit Public Television, Zach Allen, Sandra Svoboda, Colleen O'Donnell, Mila Murray, Natasha Blakely, Lana Contardi, and so many others who help to make these watch parties possible each and every month. Thank you so much for another fun watch party. We'll be back next month. And until then, bundle up and we'll see you out on the lakes. <laughs>